Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar presented by Savvy Health Solutions. Our topic today is building immunity through nutrition, exercise, and stress management. We are honored to have as our presenter, Ela Laird, who is a registered dietitian, board certified in sports dietetics, and certified personal trainer. Sheila has a Bachelor of Science in Foods and Nutrition and attended Indiana University Medical Center where she completed a dietetic internship and Master's of Science in Clinical Nutrition. Sheila's other passions are her family and competing in triathlons where she has competed in over 40 multiple distance triathlons, including the World Championship in Kona, Hawaii. During this webinar, you will have an opportunity to submit questions for Sheila by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We look forward to you learning very valuable and practical information from Sheila. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Sheila. Great, let me just get up to, all right, we're gonna get to the beginning. Um, so, Hi everybody, thank you for coming. And this is an exciting time to talk about immunity, right? Um, so my goal today is to give you this information and then leave plenty of time at the end for um, answering your questions. Um, there's, feel free to jot those down um, and be very open and candid about your questions because some of the things I'm going to talk about today, many of you have probably already heard or you, or you know what you're doing. And for some of you, it may be all brand new stuff. So let's um, get going so that we can have time for the Q&A at, um, at the end. Okay, so we're talking about today a strong immune function. And just what is that? And what does that mean to you and what you can do starting today? So I picked three things because these are the three most important things that are in your control. And we're gonna talk about nutrition and how does this play a role in managing chronic disease and inflammation, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, and obesity. We'll talk about exercise and how much is needed to improve Im immune function. And types of exercise, are you doing enough or too much? And then stress management, um, what are the lab biomarkers that you should be looking at to know how well your body, body is handling the stress? Okay, so let's start off uh, first with diet. And it's important that we talk about the difference between what is acute inflammation and what is chronic. So acute is that response of the immune system to an infection. Be like if you smashed your, your finger and there's an infection and the inflammation is there and white blood cells come and try to improve the healing. So this is, just acute. What we're going to focus on today is chronic. Chronic inflammation is part of the body's immune response. And this is powerful because inflammation has a role. Um, it's healing, but too much inflammation, chronic inflammation, can wear your body down. And it can lead to heart disease, asthma, arthritis, diabetes, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, depression, mood disorders, cancers, and rheumatoid arthritis. So it's not to say that if you have chronic inflammation, you're gonna get all these diseases. Some of these are autoimmune. And autoimmune is basically because of your genes. And there's nothing we can do about that other than try to manage it with diet. So let's look at this. Let's be clear on what is acute, what is chronic. And if you see yourself over on that right side, any of those things, having a 
predisposition to cardiovascular disease? Does it run in the family? Um, is there arthritis? Uh, there's different kinds of arthritis. There's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease. This could be a host of things that are actually creeping up in our population. Believe it or not, depression can be a sign of some sort of chronic inflammation. We're going to talk about that later. How, does, how important is the brain in controlling your inflammation? Neurological diseases. Definitely, we're looking at some of the things such as Alzheimer's being a, a type of real chronic inflammation and cancer, different kinds of cancer. Now, when we talk about causes of inflammation, let's go down this list and not be black and white about it. Stress, yes. Stress can bring on chronic inflammation. If you've been dealing with stress for a good many years of your life, more than likely you have developed some sort of low-grade chronic inflammation. A person who's sedentary, lack of exercise, and we're going to talk about that. Well, how does exercise in, improve inflammation? Genetics, this is true. Genetics may be not in your favor for some of the diseases, such as autoimmune, but that doesn't mean you can't help control it through diet and lifestyle. Toxins. We know um, clearly that certain toxins have caused chronic inflammation. Um, some of the exposures to our food crops and the daily toxins that we breathe, over time we can induce chronic inflammation. Food sensitivities. If you are sensitive to gluten because you've got celiac, or you cannot tolerate dairy. These can cause inflammation if truly you are uh, food sensitive or you have a food allergy. Being overweight is another one, and we're going to talk. Excuse, oh, sorry, we're going to talk about that. Um, how does that have anything to do with inflammation? So, when we think about what are the causes. Remember, this is not black and white. It's not that, oh, I have this, I'm going to have inflammation. But we do know that diet can make a huge impact on chronic inflammation. So let's look at this. Many of you probably have heard of the anti-inflammatory diet, and it gets thrown around a little bit loose these days on just, well, what is anti-inflammatory? So what does it include before we talk about what it is. <clears throat> and we've looked at cultures that have diets rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Their diets are naturally high in fiber and naturally high in antioxidants. Vegetables, fruits, fish, nuts, legumes, healthy fats. These are the foods that have nutrients that have been shown to have an anti-inflammatory effect. So where, what are we talking about? The Mediterranean diet pyramid is probably one of the best examples of what a true anti-inflammatory diet looks like. And if you look at what this region of the world, how they eat, and this is, we're talking about Italy, Greece, uh, Spain, and their diet, half of that pyramid is grains, beans, legumes, vegetables, fruits. And I want you to think about something that all those foods have in common, and it's fiber. And we're gonna talk about fiber later. We're gonna leave this talk knowing about fiber because it's so powerful. So as you go up that food pyramid, they include a little bit of fish and seafood. There's uh, a little bit of soy and the Asian mushrooms, which we know have powerful anti-inflammatory effects. They're high in vitamin D. And then other sources of protein. There's cheese and eggs. Then there's the herbs and spices, curcumin, turmeric, which you probably have heard is anti-inflammatory. There's green tea. A lot of green tea is in that region. And then a little bit of supplement use. And then we'll look at there, red wine. 
And what the red wine has is in the pigments of those deep red grapes is polyphenols. And we'll talk about that as well. Very little red meat in that region of the world. So when we look at why is this an anti-inflammatory diet, let's look at that it's not just one thing. It's never just one thing. It's the whole pattern of if you're primarily eating a lot of, of high fiber foods, uh, the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, and that is the basis of your diet, adding in appropriate amounts of protein, you have a eating pattern that is probably going to give you a lot of health benefits that you may not even be aware of. Unlike our SAD diet, and that is the standard American diet. Typically, not everybody, but typically it's high, has high intake of processed foods, ice cream, crackers, candy bars, pastries, sweetened drinks, fast foods, and products made with high fructose corn syrup. So let's be clear, this is not to say that if you ever have a birthday cake or you have a scoop of ice cream that you are going to have inflammation. The pattern is what we're talking about, like the Mediterranean pattern versus why have we arrived at this with the American diet being so fast and processed and high in sugars and where's the fiber? If you look at this list, so this is not pointing fingers at anybody, but we do know that there are pockets in the US that truly this is the way their diet looks. So how do you know that you have inflammation? And this is something that I think we all should be having a conversation with your practitioner. And it's CRP. C-reactive protein is a pretty good measurement of inflammation if you have it measured. And we typically see it elevated in obese people. But what we don't understand is, did the high fat body fat increase the CRP? Or was elevated CRP causing more of the obesity? We don't really know, but we do see when typically there is obesity, there is high CRP. But you can have a high CRP without obesity because of a simply poor diet. So also be aware of though, if you had an acute affection and you went in and had your CRP measured and it's high, that's not to say, oh, I've got chronic inflammation. No, this is more about just, this is just right now. But we do know, and we've seen this, that it can go up with chronic stress. So if we look at the, um, markers of inflammation or the basic labs there's a lot and this is a very short list but markers of inflammation through some basic labs could be you could start with a lipid panel and that's your cholesterol triglycerides ldls and hdls ldls are the uh, what we call the lousy cholesterol and the hdls we want high h for high those are the good ones and there's a the crp we want CRP to be one or below. If it's up above three, four, five, and I've seen some pretty high CRPs in, in some individuals, that is disconcerting. There is, that is a true marker of inflammation. Vitamin D. We have probably been hearing a lot about the importance of vitamin D right now in, um, with the virus around. So I encourage everybody, to know what are your levels, because it really is a little bit reckless to be supplementing if you don't know your levels. And you want it to be at least 50 or above. Now, if the range, the standard range goes down to 30, and if you got your labs checked and it was 31, you won't be flagged. But let's face it, 31 is not optimal. We want it up there towards 50. and you might get pushback on that, but I truly believe that if you are below 50, it would be worth supplementing with. It's called a sunshine vitamin, but we really don't make too much of it anymore through the skin. 
We're far from the equator. There's a high ozone layer. layer. Most of us wear sunscreen. So making it the sunshine vitamin isn't really as effective anymore. We have to start supplementing. Another marker that you could talk to your doctor about is homocysteine particularly if you have a history in your family of cardiovascular disease, um, homocysteine can be elevated, but it also can be elevated if you have a, um, an anomaly where you don't break down B vitamins very well. But homocysteine is worth looking at, and it is uh, different levels on different um, labs that are run. Hemoglobin A1C. If any of you have been um, looked at for prediabetes or insulin resistance, you know what this is. And it's a marker of your blood sugar. We absolutely want hemoglobin A1C to be below 5.7. And if it were going up towards six, it isn't to say, well, I've got diabetes. No, it is that you're on that slope, that you now have control of what can I do to get my blood sugar back down? Then there is in-depth labs, which would be like a full thyroid panel. And this is the one that looks at antibodies. Antibodies to rule out if there's an autoimmune disease, such as, such as Hashimoto's. And it's not typically run. Uh, autoimmune antibodies for thyroid, is not a standard test. It has to be a reason for it. And there are practitioners uh, that do run these in-depth labs, as well as, and I didn't mention, but there also is an uh, in-depth a cardiovascular test that if you have it in your family, you may wanna look and see if you've got um, the high markers of VLDL and LDL, but that's an in-depth test. Okay, so let's move on. So we have plenty of time to talk about everything. Exercise and immune function. Just what does exercise have to do with immune function? So follow along with me on this. Okay, we know that there are definitely scores for cardiorespiratory fitness. Exercise can improve that. It can lower chronic low-grade inflammation. Remember, we're talking about chronic inflammation not the acute kind. It definitely can improve your various immune markers in disease states such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. And one of the things that is current in the, um, you might say, I don't say the literature right now because it's too early to talk about the effects of what is COVID doing, but there is some correlations that they're seeing that the people who have underlying diabetes, or obesity, or cardiovascular disease are the ones that are getting hit harder with recovering from COVID. Okay, so starting there up at the top left, how does this exercise work? And maybe if you don't like exercise, this might give you a reason to do so. So each bout of exercise, particularly whole body, dynamic cardio exercise, this mobilizes billions of these immune cells. Then the immune cells that are mobilized with exercise are recirculated between the blood and tissues to increase host immune surveillance. And this is a term that you might start hearing quite a bit in the news, immune surveillance, because this is what is what we're looking at for creating a, a robust immune system is the surveillance. So then these, goes on, they, these immune cells makes us more resistant to in, infection. And then the exercise releases various substances that can help maintain immunity. So my thought is that if we understand why exercise could help with immune function, if it's not something that you enjoy, I always feel that as a nutrition educator, it's my job to give you the reasons why. And then you have to make the decision, well, I know why now I should be doing this, not just that I was told. And be that critical thinker to say, you know, I think I should start a cardiovascular program or an exercise program. So 
let's let's talk about this immune surveillance because I I really believe we're going to hear more and more about this. When you exercise, soon after your workout, these immune cells will actually start to decline. This is after your workout. You increase them during, then they go down. Then these immune cells are sent to other bodily locations. And this is what's called the immune surveillance. These are like the little warriors out there looking for something. These immune cells then go onto the lungs, maybe skin, intestine, mucosal surfaces. You know what that means, uh, the nose, the respiratory tract where an infection might be found. So this kickstart to the immune system is temporary. It lasts about three hours after each exercise session. So if you rec continue to exercise regularly, you're going to have these effects after each session. So that is a pretty good deal. That all you have to do is keep it going most days of the week, and you have improved your immune surveillance. <clears throat> so creating these robust immune cells that act like little army rangers. And David Neiman, he's a researcher out of Appalachian State, said it nice. These very specialized, powerful immune cells are like army rangers of the military. They come out, circulate during exercise, and at a higher rate than normal than if you were sedentary. Pathogens are more easily detected and destroyed. So think of your surveillance as these little army rangers. We're increasing these, these immune cells from exercise that can actually work on destroying some of the process of pathogens. So how much do you need? How much is enough exercise? So the general recommendation is at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. So let's break that down, 150 minutes. If you went out five days a week for 30 minutes, a robust, vigorous, nice walk, you're there. Or what if you mixed it up with a little bit of more vigorous exercise, hiking, or some of the um, group exercises that are being offered, or um, we all have heard of some of the CrossFit exercises. Anything that can bring heart rate up is considered more vigorous. So you look at, if this is what it takes, 150 minutes a week, 75 at the minimum, I really think this is doable for most people. I, and We've all probably seen more people out walking now, and it's, it's wonderful. And they're all um, making their little army rangers. Okay, moving to stress and immunity. So this is a big one. Stress can break the body down. So cortisol is this hormone that's released from the adrenals. It's a stress hormone. And if we have a too high level of cortisol, you will not sleep very well. It, it goes to increasing belly fat. It affects thyroid. It's harder to recover from exercise. You have poor decision-making, brain fog, and it can flare up an autoimmune condition that you might already have. So when we look at the importance of immunity, how important it is to get a handle on stress management. So our thoughts, it's powerful. You have the ability to send certain chemicals to the brain to reduce stress. One of those things happens during exercise. You've all heard of endorphins. And when you are done exercising, a brisk walk, a hike, a bike ride, you feel better. And it's not just made up. Chemically, you have changed. And these are the chemicals that can help reduce stress. So, oh my goodness, I think it's stress. <laughs> and this is the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic. We've all been in that fight or flight. How does what you think affect your stomach? You get the nervousness when say you're going to go do a talk or you're going to feel going into a meeting or before a big exam in college or why? is your stomach talking to you, 
but it's your brain that's sending out these messages and it's causing you to be a very unhappy zebra. Okay, so we want to be a happy zebra, which is the parasympathetic. And this is the rest, digest, calm. It is critical that we try to get some parasympathetic time every day. And it doesn't have to be a lot to reset your brain. Not a lot, absolutely, you can do it. So, well, how does the brain have anything to do with the gut and the gut with the brain? So, Hippocrates, you've all probably heard of Hippocrates. He was this amazing doctor way before his time who was known for treating the patient, not the disease. And his message, was that all disease begins in the gut and that health is determined by the microbiota or biota of our guts. Now remember, we're talking about brain and gut. Okay, so stick with me on this. What does the gut have to do with my brain? Because we are all connected. How you think and what's going on in your gut is going to send messages to your brain. The gut-brain connection is massively uh, powerful. And you have the ability to improve brain health. We've seen it in autism. We have in changed diets of kids on the spectrum and they have improved because we changed the gut health. And it's, it's amazing what we can do with depression, mood, brain fog, obesity, certain bacteria strains now are being isolated for different disease processes. This gut-brain connection is because we want the happy hormone. Remember the happy zebra? <laughs> Serotonin is high. It's regulated by the amount of bacteria in the gut in early life. So those kids playing in the dirt, playing on the farm, they have an advantage to a very sterile environment, which is what we are in now. An adult brain function depends on the presence of gut microbes in that early development. And what can change that gut-brain connection? Massive doses of antibiotics, your diet, infections, all these can change how the brain is functioning based on bacteria coming from the gut. So hopefully this is not all new to, to you, and maybe it's new for some of you, but have you heard of what is a leaky gut? The leaky gut, I mean, it doesn't mean that your stomach is pouring out contents. So let's look at this very closely. Over there on the left, that is, should be the inside of your intestines. They're tight junctions and they've got those little cilia hairs that just are full of mucus and keeping everything in the intestine where it's supposed to be. Now, if those tight junctions open up because of stress or a food allergy that you didn't know you had, an infection, look at that infection. That little virus looks very familiar. Antibiotics. Um, sometimes pregnancy, not always, but these infections can attack the inside of your intestines, open up the tight junctions, and what do you know? You've got inflammation. Now, this can show up differently in a lot of people. Leaky gut just means you are not keeping what's inside in. And this can show up in sore joints. It can show up in, some people say, well, when I eat certain foods, I get really, really brain fogged at the, afterwards. Maybe those are people that are sensitive to too much gluten. Other people say, I get, gluten's fine. My point is how important it is to keep that, those tight junctions where they're supposed to be. And that is, not letting anything that's on the inside out. So what can you do? Fiber, there we are again. So insoluble fiber, just like that pyramid that was on the um, Mediterranean side of the world. 
psyllium, oat bran, or even oatmeal, brown rice, flax seed, green bananas, we'll get back to that, lima beans, kidney beans, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, broccoli, carrots, apricots. These are super high in those insoluble fibers. What makes them so special? Well, there is this thing called butyrate, and this is increased from those fibers. And this butyrate has a powerful anti-inflammatory effect on gut health. It is made when the good bacteria in your gut breaks down that dietary fiber. So that good bacteria needs fiber. The more diverse your fiber is, it's like the rainforest. You want to think of all these species of bacteria, the more, the better, the diverse you can get, which is why if you only like two kinds of vegetables, maybe you could start on three. Or if you like a lot of vegetables, keep it going. The point is, the more diverse that fiber is in your gut, the better chances you're going to have that species of bacteria increase. And what are the other things that can help promote a healthy gut? There's the parasympathetic again. Yoga, meditation, deep breathing. And there's even, there was a really interesting study where they looked at people that live in the city, like in New York, where they go from their apartment to an indoor garage, to an indoor office, back to their indoor garage, to their indoor apartment. They never go outside. And there is definitely something to be said for when you wake up in the morning from the door. And if you can do it barefoot, step out and just reset, slow down, breathe, calm, and re reconnect with your parasympathetic. And this can, you can do this during the day. You could do it right now. You could do it before a meeting. But we can't constantly be in this sympathetic where it is just fight or flight all day long. It is going to destroy our guts. So my message is to feed your microbiome. Fiber, fiber, fiber. The more, the better. And the more diverse, the better. Because if you, if you think about it, you're, people ask me, well, well, if I don't like vegetables, should I take the probiotics? The, the, the bacteria, that can only work to a point because when you take a probiotic, you have to keep taking it because it will go away. And we know now that there are certain species of probiotics that should be only for women or for only for men. We have to keep probiotics in context and not just say, yes, take a probiotic. I mean, it's a little bit of the Wild West when we come to probiotics. And they have a, pra a place. Um, they can help if you're traveling. They can help if there are bouts of diarrhea to reset, get that fiber or those mi uh, microbiome bacteria back up to speed quickly, and then go to fiber. Coming off of antibiotics might be a good time, but you could also do it with your diet. Okay. I want to talk about this because this is something that I believe is important for you to understand. We have some simple things we can do in these crazy times. Our immune resilience can be done with very simple steps. And when we talk about natural antioxidants, these foods that are high in flavonoids or polyphenols, like the red, pomegranate juice, the red grape juice, or red apples, anything that's deep in color, have these natural anti, anti, antioxidants. Green tea is known for its antioxidants. Citrus fruits. We need an abundance of these, and we need natural antioxidants. Just taking vitamin C and A and E just isn't the same. It really isn't. It's not packaged the same. We don't know if it's delivered to the body the same. So another reason of why you can benefit from more fruit and vegetables. Fiber, there it is again. Uh, it's going to feed your microbiome. 
with diversity. We want that species of good bacteria to be as diverse as you can possibly make it. And it doesn't mean you have to eat a ton of vegetables every day, but a small salad with your dinner or even cooked like roasted vegetables, um, fruit throughout the day. Um, I had mentioned the green banana because the type of fiber that's in a green banana is what we call the resistant starch. And it is the same as if you were to cook and cool potatoes, cook and then cool pasta and green bananas. This resistant starch is powerful for increasing that butyrate. So if you like pasta, but you feel like, well, I shouldn't be eating it, it's too starchy, let it cool and make a cool, um, a cool pasta salad and throw some vegetables in it. And you've got a great jump on the, uh, the species or the good bacteria that you're going to feed your biome. What about healthy fats? We know that these fried foods um, in abundance, not the occasional fried food, box foods, these actually really put a strain on your antioxidant reserves. We need these antioxidant reserves right now, especially now, because taking these antioxidants, again, I want to say it, abundant of supplements is not going to be the same. So why not, instead of taking all these supplements, just take a look at how much fried food is in one's diet, box foods, processed foods. Simple carbs, these heavy carbohydrate meals that make people sleepy, sugar, sweets, cookies, these are all those insulin surges that could have a pro-inflammatory effect on your body. Now, if you are more prone to diabetes, pre-diabetic, or obesity, more than ever should you be looking at not having all these insulin surges because they are pro-inflammatory. And again, the inflammation is going to be hard on your immune system. And we want a robust immune system. Now, sleep is not eating, but sleep. Study after study after study now is showing how powerful it is for resetting our, our hormones. At night, you decrease cortisol and improve the ability to handle stress. Remember, going back to that nutrition, exercise, stress. But sleep, you get into those deep sleep patterns. So it's not the amount of sleep you're getting, it's how deep the sleep is. If you can remember a dream, you probably were in a pretty good deep sleep. And if sleep is a problem, if there's, I mean, that sleep could actually be a whole hour. We could talk about how lack of sleep is destroying health of so many people. But it's, it's made, a lot of people have actually said they're sleeping more now because they don't have to commute to work. Um, they're not waking up to an alarm, which is fabulous because now they have reset to their own by their own diurnal rhythm and that diurnal rhythm is what happens in that 12 hours you wake up and then you have your own set clock you eat according to when you're hungry it's powerful um i think that if any of you have ever gone without sleep you know how lousy you feel you don't make good decisions you crave carbs it's it's tough you're you're crabby. Um, it, sleep is should probably have been put up there as number one before, before everything. These are not in any hierarchy, but I wanted to mention these because I feel that with all the talk we're getting right now about immune, 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 and what should you take, I want you to step back and say, well, what do you have control of? And you certainly have control of how much you're eating in, from the produce department. And are you taking control of your sleep? Are you doing the sleep hygiene where you try to get to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time? And yeah, you have some sweets. It's not to say if you have a little, you destroyed your immune system. No, we keep this in context. 
we go back to the 80-20 rule. But these simple steps right here is what I really wanted to leave you with because these are in your control when we feel like everything's not in our control right now. We are not done with having the challenge of having a powerful immune system. Now is our chance to, to say, well, you know what? Maybe I should pay more attention to my immune system and go back to cooking and shopping and, and not eating out as much and not doing the fast foods because I don't have to. So I wanted to leave you with this because I think it's a powerful message because it's simple. Okay. So um, we have good on time some questions and I want to look up here. So I will go to the Q&A. Um, feel free to just pop them in and I'm going to answer them as they come in. Um, so the first question is, what are your thoughts on exercise on the onset of feeling sick? And what points should you stop exercising and resting during illness? So when the feeling is sick, I always believe that if there's any sense of a, a temperature, a fever, no, no, because your body is already working hard with the, with the, that's what the fever is. It's, it's, it's increasing the immunity to try to fight off this infection. So feeling sick. Now, if it's um, just a little bit of respire in your lungs, you have to ask yourself, well, would I feel better going out and just doing a walk? I would say look at the intensity because you don't need to be challenging your lungs and coughing if you feel bad. And so it's a judgment call on if you have a fever, no. If you have a little bit of conge chest congestion, go out, but keep the intensity down. Well, oftentimes people just feel better because the blood circulating can help. Okay, um, is there a heart rate level that differentiates moderate from vigorous? Good question. So this is very individual. And what you want to know is keep track of what your resting heart rate looks like in the morning. And, and it, could, it could vary five beats. So you want to look at what's my resting? Then you, let's say you go out for a vigorous walk. I mean, like we're going to walk, we're going to walk fast to that stop sign. And then we're going to cruise. And then we're going to walk fast again. If you can, take your heart rate. You don't have to have a monitor, but you can just stop and take your pulse. That is what we call pretty much moderate. Vigorous would be more like if you're in, like, say, a group exercise class where you're doing the boot camp type stuff, or it's the CrossFit, or um, so to give you a number on what is a heart rate of vigorous exercise, it's very individual. And there is no formula out there that can say, take your age and minus this and you'll get your max heart rate. It doesn't work. I would have you, I would suggest you just take your own and see where it is like in the middle of an exercise class or an exercise um, or walking or cycling. You'll start seeing a pattern, but also you can go by just the talk test. Some some excellent studies have come out of the talk test. If you are exercising, you're walking along, you're hiking, and you can say the Pledge of Allegiance with air, or you can sing happy birthday, that's good. That's not sedentary. But if you struggle with saying the Pledge of Allegiance or talking, that's vigorous. I think the talk test works great um, because. Heart rate on some days for some people can lie because if you're dehydrated or you didn't sleep well or stressed, heart rate is going to give you some false numbers. So I like the talk test. It works really, really well. Um, if you just remember, can you sing? <laughs> if you can't sing and you're trying to go vigorous, go harder or go, go easier. Okay. Um, Thank you. Can we get a copy? I believe Paul will be getting you a copy of this presentation. Yes. Um, 
Thank you for sharing. How many IUs of D3 should you take as supplementing to raise levels? So um, depending on what your numbers are, if you are in the basement, what I call down there, like around 30, we want to just hit you hard for a month. And I, I don't want to be reckless in giving out suggestions on um, supplements because it would be unprofessional. But what I have seen work with people that I have worked with is that if their levels are really low, we'll go one month taking 5,000 IUs, then drop down to 2,000, then in three months, four months, get retested, and then stay on a maintenance dose of 1,000 IUs, maybe 2,000 IUs. If you are just slightly low, like maybe 40, not bad, I would suggest just stay on 1,000 IUs a day. It, it's the recommended RDA for uh, D3 is too low. It, it won't work. So um, again, depending on how low you are would depend on how hard you hit it. But you're safe at 1,000 to 2,000 IUs a day, even if you didn't get tested. Okay, does shorter multiple sessions a day, such as two to three 15 minute walks increased immune response in yes. This actually is the model of a test that they did in Cupertino with Apple people. And they did two groups of people and they had two groups that did exercise multiple times, one in, once in the morning and once at lunch or at lunch in the evening. And then the other ones just did it in the morning. And they did some different um, biomarkers on them, um, weight, and they found that the multiple short ones were just as good as the one that just did the long one. Now, if your goal is for immune response, that works. Now, if your goal is for other things like fitness to run a 10K, that's a little different. But for immune, yes. Because you know what that's also doing? You're resetting yourself. You're going out twice, three times a day. You're getting fresh air. You're resetting those hormones more than just once. So highly recommend it. If you can get in 15 minutes twice, three times a day, do it. Fried foods. I've been hearing a lot about processed vegetables as being inflammatory. Is this a rule? Oh, this is a big bag of worms. <laughs> okay, so when the original studies came out on vegetable oils as being just, just so nasty, when they did these original um, studies, what they didn't tease out was trans fats out of, out of what was in the people's diets. Trans fats are those hard fats, the nasty fats, the ones that absolutely have no place in our diet. In Europe, trans fats are banned from the foods and you should be looking at all labels for trans fats. We, won't, we don't want trans fats. So it kind of skewed this whole thing about vegetable oils being inflammatory. So I absolutely believe that olive oil is much better for us for a lot of other reasons. Monounsaturates, which is anti-inflammatory. And the vegetable oils that would be in most people's diet is because they're getting in french fries or onion rings or the things that you would get at say in an outburger, um, those aren't being cooked in olive oil. It's processed vegetable oils that are used over and over again. So I think what I always want to remind you of is keep it in context. Is vegetable oils part of your diet or is it just occasional? And I mean, very occasional. Vegetable oils are not as harmful as say, the hard fats, the trans fats, those are going to get you probably more than the vegetable oils. But beware, where are you getting vegetable oils? Most likely it's in fried foods that have been used over and over and over again, the oils over and over again in uh, restaurants. What do you think about the ketogenic diet? Oh, here's another hour. <laughs> um, the ketogenic diet, <clears throat> it depends on who it is, and why we're using it. Um, in, in, in a very uh, short way of saying this, okay, ketogenic diet first came out for the use of um, epilepsy. And it was very effective because the ketones going to the brain. 
it's very effective what we're still seeing in say Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. These are neurodegenerative diseases. That is what ketogenic diets first started out as. Then it became mainstream and now um, a lot of people are doing the keto diet a little without a lot of guidance. Um, going into ketosis is not a pleasant experience having the keto flu. But if a person is really struggling with diabetes, there is a role for the ketogenic diet. And I keep this in context because it can truly help regulate insulin because there's no insulin around, there's no carbs. You've only got 50 grams of carbs a day. That's a half an apple, a carrot, and maybe an orange at the most. That's it, not even that much. So to be in ketosis, burning primarily fats, no carbs, you don't have insulin around, it can be very effective for diabetics or persons with um, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Beyond that, I don't see why a person would want to do it because first of all, the ketogenic diet is not going to promote a healthy biome. There's not enough fiber. And it's low in protein for most people. And women cannot afford to go low in protein because you'll lose muscle mass. And so the low protein, not good for women. The low diversity of fiber, not good for your microbiome. So I pretty much have to stop there because on ketogenic diets, I could go on for an hour. And I have, I've done a presentation on just ketogenic diets. So um, we have to put it in context. So I hope, I hope that answers your question there. Um, let's see, I think I've got through all of the questions. Um, yes, is there any other ones that I missed? That was it, yes. Um, so. Yep. Great job, Sheila. <laughs> thank you everybody for attending today's webinar and uh, like the one question we will make this available uh, we have recorded it and we will make sure that we get that over to um, your location um, so thank you again Sheila that was great information and I hope everyone walks away and starts to implement some of the practices and um, we just wish everyone well, stay well, mm -hmm. and um, thank you again. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, everyone. Have a great afternoon.